Welcome to the Global HIV Clinical Forum 2020 Optimizing Treatment. My name is Jonathan Shapiro from the National Hemophilia Center at Sheba Medical Center in Israel. On behalf of my co-chair, Charles Boucher from Erasmus Medical Center in the Netherlands, we're delighted you're joining us. This is a two-day meeting, and today we'll be having our second day, which will once again be three and a half hours. Our learning objectives are detailed here, and they focus on new treatment and new treatment strategies, and we invite you to read them in detail on the website. But it's very simple. What we're trying to do here today is really improve our clinical care of people living with HIV. To that end, our program, both yesterday and today, have a spectacular lineup of top international experts speaking on their topic of expertise and then actually having a roundtable discussion. We are CME accredited, and you can claim your CME credits online. And I'd like to give a special thank you to Vive Healthcare, who've provided an independent educational grant for this meeting. Uh, the sponsor has not been involved in any way in the development of the content or the decision on the speakers. We have today two more excellent sessions. One, optimizing clinical implementation of long-acting therapies, and the second on HIV prevention and cure. If you have questions, we'd be delighted if you can submit them through the Q&A window in Zoom. We'll try to get to as many of them as possible. And with that, I'd like to invite our chair, Anton Pozniak, from Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London to chair the next session. Thank you. Jonathan, thank you so much. So session three is optimizing clinical implementation of long-acting therapies, which many of us think are going to be the future of HIV. So uh, the, we have a wonderful group who are going to discuss this with us. Monica Gandhi from the University of California, San Francisco, David Back from the University of Liverpool, Pedro Khan from the Fundacion Westbed in Buenos Aires, and uh, there'll be a, a talk by me as well about implementing long-acting injectables in, in the time of COVID. But I'd like to first introduce our first speaker, which is Monica Gandhi. Now, I've got to know Monica very well over the last couple of years because she's a local co-chair of AIDS 2020, which is now virtual. She's uh, been a wonderful colleague and works in San Francisco as a professor of medicine and associate division chief at UCSF and San Francisco General Hospital. Uh, she's a medical director of the HIV clinic uh, at San Francisco General Hospital, which is known as Ward 86. And she's going to talk to us today about how and when to monitor patients on long acting antivirals. It's a great pleasure to introduce you, Monica. My name is Monica Gandhi. I'm a professor of medicine at UCSF, and today I'm going to talk about optimizing clinical implementation of long-acting therapies, how and when to monitor. So first, let's talk and start with where are we with long-acting antiretroviral therapy today? To really go over the data so we can understand where we stand and how to monitor for therapy, Let's talk about the two major studies that looked at long-acting cabotegravir and ropivirine. The first study was the FLARE study, and the 96-week results of this study was presented at CROI 2020. Remember that this was a phase three randomized controlled trial comparing the antiviral activity of intramuscular cabotegravir plus ropivirine, long-acting, versus continuing the um, first-line therapy, which was dolotegravir, abacavir, and 3TC, in previously antiretroviral naive patients. And the 48-week data was presented in the New England Journal, and here is the 96-week data, which showed that there was an 86.6% virologic suppression rate with those on intramuscular cabotegravir lopivirine versus an 89.4% virologic suppression rate with the oral regimen and treatment naive patients, showing the non-inferiority of the long-acting art regimen. 
Um, when we look at the New England Journal article of the 48-week data, it's important to note that given monthly, because the design of flare was given every four weeks, the plasma concentrations of intramuscular cabotegravir and ropivirine are consistently above the PAIC90 of the virus. And so the next question becomes, what if you give this every eight weeks, intramuscular long-acting cab and ropivirine? And also, what happens with plasma concentrations if you stop cabotegravir and ropivirine? So to answer the first question, in terms of looking every eight weeks, we have to turn to the ATLAS study. The first ATLAS study actually looked at giving cabotegravir and ropivirine every four weeks in patients who are experienced on antiretroviral therapy. The ATLAS 2M study, which was just presented at CROI 2020, the study design was different. It really was to look at long-acting cabotegravir and ropivirine given every eight weeks. This was a phase three RCT, and it was comparing the antiviral activity of giving cab and ropivirine in the ATLAS study every four weeks after people had been suppressed to every eight weeks, and that was, again, the ATLAS 2M design, 2M standing for two months. And so you can see the design of the study here, People, of course, had an oral lead-in phase, and then they were either continued on the every four weeks or they were randomized to the every eight-week regimen. Uh, this was the study characteristics of the study population. You can see that there were approximately 500 in each arm. You can see that there was about a quarter of participants being female, cisgender. Um, and you can see that uh, there was some diversity of participants. It was predominantly white um, study, but there was 17% African-American and 8% other. The study results are shown on this slide. You can see that um, long-acting cabotegravir and ropivirine given every eight weeks, up to 48 weeks, showed non-inferior design to ATLAS uh, 1M, or the uh, long-acting antiretroviral regimen given every four weeks. So you can see that there was non-inferiority for the virologic success rate, as shown in the left-hand panel, and really, giving the long-acting antiretroviral agents every eight weeks was equivalent in terms of virologic success in giving it every four weeks, which is a huge advantage in terms of administration in the clinic. It is important to note though, and this will come up when we talk about monitoring, that even though plasma levels, even with giving every eight, giving every four weeks, but really giving every four weeks are shown here, even though they're well above the PAIC90 of the virus, if you give it every four weeks, following long-acting treatment discontinuation, there's very long what we call pharmacokinetic tails. And what that means is if you stop the therapies, there's a very long period of time in which plasma levels are high with both cabotegravir and ropivirine. They can even be detectable in plasma out to a year. And this is a um, study that was published and shown at CROI 2020. And you can see out to a year that you can still have plasma levels that are detectable of both compounds. This is very important to note because you don't want that long-acting tail. You don't want um, ongoing viral replication, virologic replication to be occurring in the setting of low-level drug levels. And so you have to start oral antiretroviral therapy immediately after someone stops therapy. And this is going to be a prime point when we talk about monitoring on long-acting antiretroviral therapy. This study also showed that whatever you use as your alternative oral ART uh, regimen as long acting is stopped is fine. You can use anything you want. There isn't drug-drug interactions between the long acting PK tail of these agents and whatever antiretroviral therapy we wanna start. So the next part is then how and when do we monitor for outcomes on long acting antiretroviral therapy? Well, it's important to know why we even developed long-acting antiretroviral therapy. Why was this even an issue? And that's because adherence. It is hard to take daily therapy every day. It may comfort us to know in the HIV world that we're not the only ones. The World Health Organization has declared that more people worldwide would benefit from efforts to improve medication adherence than from the development of even new medical therapies. Non-adherence has been called America's, quote, other drug problem. Only 51% of Americans who are treated for cardiovascular disease or diabetes with chronic oral therapy are adherent to their therapy. 
and about 20 to 50 percent of people who are on statins discontinue them within a year of treatment. So the important part is that non-adherence is a major part of taking any chronic therapy daily. It's a hard thing to do. And essentially, as the former Surgeon General in the United States said, drugs don't work in patients who don't take them. So this is why we've been interested and why long-acting antiretroviral therapy has been developed. It's challenging to take oral antiretroviral therapy for a number of reasons. Of course, it's been revolutionary. Of course, these long acti these I'm sorry, oral antiretroviral therapies have been important to decreasing and really eliminating mortality from the disease. But it's hard to take a regimen every day. It's difficulty. Uh, there's difficulty in keeping patients linked and staying in care. It's harder for people who are young, racial, ethnic minorities, uh, people who have mental illness, people who have cognitive impairment, food insecurity, unstable housing, adverse effects to take an oral antiretroviral therapy every day. People have pill fatigue. They're tired of taking it. There are cost constraints and a lack of political will to ensure even access to antiretroviral therapy across the world. And there's the stigma of a daily pill. It reminds you, quote, I have HIV. And so there are issues taking um, a long, uh, oral antiretroviral therapy every day, which is why there's been such an interest in developing long-acting antiretroviral therapy, and now why we are here at this point in 2020 at the precipice of having these long-acting antiretroviral therapies available in the clinic. So who do we think will want these long-acting antiretroviral therapies if we can administer them, for example, every eight weeks in the clinic? Well, it's often been said that it may be a bimodal population. It may be people who are very adherent to therapy, but they're just tired of taking the oral antiretroviral therapy. They don't want to be reminded to take it, and they actually would like a convenient way to get their antiretroviral therapy, have that once every two months, and go on their way. That would be the highly adherent patients. There's also a great deal of interest in patients who have uh, problems taking um, therapy every day. The poorly adherent patients, there's a lot of interest in long-acting antiretroviral therapies for this population. And to speak to the latter, I do want to um, comment that uh, many of us know that there is a ACTG study called the A5359 study, which has been dubbed the Latitude Study, which is studying long-acting injectable antiretroviral therapy in poorly adherent populations. People have had traditionally a hard time taking daily antiretroviral therapy. 5359 will give us the answers about how to administer long-acting antiretroviral therapy in these poorly adherent populations using incentives and so on. So what are, however, the systems and individual level challenges to long-acting antiretroviral therapy? It's also not going to be that easy to administer long-acting antiretroviral therapy, and it's important for us to troubleshoot the barriers that we may perceive in using this modality of therapy. Well, there are some systems levels barriers. It may impose a burden on the clinic. It may be hard to have so many appointments every two months for the administration of the long-acting uh, regimen. You have to track the visits, ensure that no one comes in, you know, uh, long after they're due because we don't want that long PK tail. Individual level barriers, you know, right now, um, for naive patients, this is going to be um, actually approved every four weeks. It's hard to come to a clinic every four weeks um, for an injection. Um, and there may be clinic wait times. You don't want to wait and, and, and get that injection. There's cost considerations and accessibility. How much is this going to cost? What is um, insurance going to do in terms of coverage? If someone, as we said before, can't come in on time, they're going to need oral pills for bridges during travel. Say they can't come in every two, uh, eight weeks. They're going to need um, oral pills at home to take during those emergency times. We are going to absolutely need um, uh, an approval process in countries outside the U.S. and in resource-limited settings and endorsement by global guideline committees for these to be distributed worldwide. There are definitely knowledge gaps for pregnancy and breastfeeding women and children, and we're gonna need a steady supply chain and if needed, a cold chain for these drugs. So those are all system level barriers. And it may be hard for the patient to feel that they have to come in every four to eight weeks. They may find that stigmatizing to go to the clinic that often. So there are gonna be systems levels and individual level barriers to administration of long acting. So how are we going to monitor that? How are we going to monitor the administration of long-acting antiretroviral therapy? Well, 
We have good ways to monitor for adherence uh, with oral therapies. Um, actually, the best way to monitor is just ask them, how are you taking your medication, that self-report. Of course, self-report is biased by having people say that they're taking them when they're not, recall bias, social desirability bias. And so we have a host of other adherence metrics in 2020, um, 2020 for uh, monitoring oral antiretroviral therapy, pharmacy refills, pill counts, of course, looking at virologic suppression, electronic monitoring, MEMS caps. We, we have pharmacologic measures like looking at plasma levels, urine levels, um, levels in dried blood spots, uh, levels of drugs and hair, and then even giving someone directly absorbed therapy every day, which is of course expensive. But remember, adherence isn't the question with long-acting antiretroviral therapy. We're no, we know when they're gonna get it because we're gonna be the ones administering it at the clinic uh, level. The, the question about monitoring here is how to ensure that people come in on time for those shots. So how are we gonna monitor for failure on long-acting antiretroviral therapy? Remember what gets measured gets managed. Well, of course, viral loads is gonna be a mainstay, but we're not gonna, and we don't yet have these pharmacologic measures of adherence. We have them developed for oral antiretroviral therapy, these drug levels in hair and drug levels in, in dried blood spots and urine. We don't have any of these pharmacologic measures yet developed for the long-acting antiretroviral therapies. We can do a plasma level, but we don't yet know what that means. So how are we gonna monitor? Well, even though for oral ART, we have a host of metrics to monitor, we really need a way that for those highly adherent patients and those patients who are poorly adherent, we have to monitor in between injections how people are doing and ensure that people come in time for injections. So um, this is a study that I wanted to present near the end of this talk to tell you how people are thinking about it. This is a very nice qualitative study that was presented in PROS1 as people were going through the long-acting antiretroviral therapy studies. And people absolutely said, and so did the providers, it's gonna be convenient, there are gonna be emotional benefits, it's gonna be great to not have to tell someone that you're taking a pill every day, to not remind yourself that you have HIV by having long-acting antiretroviral therapy. But what all the providers said in this study is what if people have lapses? The PK tail is concerning and it's real. And so how do we ensure that people come in on time? Well, there are lots of ideas that are out there and I think that all clinics are gonna start thinking of creative ideas and how to do this. For those highly adherent patients, we are thinking about shock clinics where you come in, you don't have to wait for an appointment, you just go in and out to the shock clinic, you get your shot every eight weeks and you're out. Another idea is pharmacies administering these shots instead of waiting um, uh, for clinic times. Pharmacies can uh, and are trained for intramuscular injections, so go in and out of a pharmacy. And then providing the patient with a constant bridge at home. If there's some reason they can't come in, have them have oral cavitagrin ropivirine at home so they can start taking that pill while we're waiting for them to come in for their next injection. What about non-adherent patients? Well, there's been a lot talked about, including with the 5359 study about incentives. Let's incentivize patients to come in, financial incentives, gift cards, something that we can help people come in on time. And if need be, mobile vans. Uh, we can go out and help administer these medications to uh, people who are marginally housed using a mobile van unit. So all of these, I think, are very creative ideas on how to circumvent the barriers for long-acting antiretroviral therapy administration. Um, and then we're thinking about uh, pharmacologic metrics. One idea is to actually do a hair level of a drug and you'll be able to tell how long they've had since their visit um, by measuring hair levels or by measuring plasma levels. And these all need to be um, studied further. So in conclusion, I want to just state that I think long-acting antiretroviral therapy is gonna revolutionize treatment for um, antiretroviral therapy in the clinic. We have shown now through the FLARE and ATLAS trials that it's effective in naive and experienced patients. And certainly I think that long-acting cavitegravir as shown in ATLAS 2M is likely to be able to be administered every eight weeks instead of every four weeks. It's important to note that the tail is real, it's long. Injections should be on time. And if for some reason they're not, we need to give an ability to immediately start an oral antiretroviral therapy if the injections to be delayed. Adherence has been taken out of the equation at some level in terms of daily pill taking, but it's now not about daily pill taking, it's about keeping on time with your injections.
And that's the new definition of adherence with long-acting antiretroviral therapy. Clinics need to be creative on how to make it easier for those who need it, how to come in and out for the highly adherent, and for those who have a hard time taking medications and centers and mobile bands. And we need to develop metrics um, like hair levels and plasma metrics beyond viral load monitoring that can help monitor how people are doing on therapy. Thank you very much for your attention. Monica, thank you so much for that. It's uh, covered a lot of ground about monitoring, but I wanted to just ask you that when you devolve giving injections to pharmacies, uh, nurses that go out or other sorts of forms of way outside of the clinic, how are you going to know that patients actually got the injection? Uh, have you already thought about uh, whether you're going to have apps for the patient themselves or something that, that can be used to centralize the data to, to know that they've had it? Because I could just say, oh, yeah, I had it two, I had it two months ago. Yes, yeah, so I think that is the Achilles heel and the entire concern about long-acting injectables, like we talked about, is that the long pharmacokinetic tail means that there really should be very little time between stopping the injections if someone decides to go off injections and starting oral ART. You don't want that time where you have subtherapeutic levels with uh, cabotegravendral pivoting to happen. So I think there are multiple ways to try to get around that. If someone decides to stop their therapy, I think that for very with it individuals, um, they should have oral bridges at home. They can have oral cabotegravir and oral lopinavir at home so that somehow they have to travel, something goes off, that they have an ability to start oral um, ARV at home. Um, I think that we should be tracking people's injections every eight weeks extremely carefully so that if they don't show up for their injection, we're calling them, we're texting them, we're trying to figure out how to get them in. Um, I think for those populations who are more vulnerable and um, the, the, the less adherent populations, I would suggest following them around. We're thinking about a mobile van um, to ensure that we get injections out to the poorly adherent patients who are homeless in our city. Um, and then in the pharmacy level, it really is about, um, about the, we have to keep strict track. Well, I, I, I wouldn't let it go way past nine weeks, for example, with that PK tail. So we had to, we had to be very, very uh, vigilant about keeping track. You know, in another way, we don't have to keep track every day, but we do have to keep track. Though every eight weeks, we have to be very vigilant. Yeah, so, so really, you need an umbrella data, data management system for this, because without it, yes. uh, as you say, people could get lost uh, quite yes. easily. And, I, I I, and, and what I want to ask you, really, is a follow-on from that, is that people traveling. Okay, so <laughs> uh, I, see an, I see an advantage. You could go traveling without having to take your pills with you by having your injections, but also people go traveling. Uh, what advice are you saying to people who go traveling? Because you imagine the number of people during this COVID epidemic that got stuck in places, yeah, and uh, couldn't yes. get back to places. So is, is there an issue in, in sort of monitoring where patients are going and what they're doing. Yes, I totally agree that we have to monitor that. Now, on the other hand, the lucky thing is that oral ART can be started after an injection has stopped because you got stuck or you can't get your next injection. And it doesn't seem like the lingering tail of cabotegravir and ropivirine will influence the pharmacokinetics of any ART regimen that you start. So, if someone is stuck, if it's really just about immediately starting oral art, and it doesn't have to be, of course, oral cabotegravir and ropivirine. That's what they were on, but it can be any, um, you know, drug regimen. Usually, three drugs that they would be they would have been on before, and they have some left, and we just restart it right away. So it really is just essentially that that. Um, that we know that I would not start oral ART any longer than like a week after the injection was supposed to be given um, so that you still have those kind of high levels of those other drugs and then restart your oral ART right away. And, and it appeared to me that with the injectables, uh, the, the best monitors of adherence is knowing they've had it and they've viral load, all the other stuff. I mean, if you do, do hair analysis, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how much that's going to help you with this sort of thing. I agree. I have always to throw hair in there, but um, I completely agree. It's that very interesting. Yeah. Adherence, adherence becomes actually no longer about tracking the individual. It actually becomes about tracking the clinic or the pharmacy yeah. or the, the, the day that, that they get the injection. So it's a completely novel way of tracking adherence, which it's really 
healthcare professionals and the clinic to ensure that we have, like you said, an entire data management tracking system in place that we don't let this person, Mr. X, go you know, longer than their eight weeks. Um, so that's really what adherence is. Of course, viral load has always been the, the gold standard of, of monitoring for adherence, um, but we don't want loss of viral load to herald the first signal that injectables aren't working. So the first signal is it's been eight weeks in one day, and then we, we go and try to find them. Yeah, well, thanks, Monica. We're going to have a roundtable discussion at the end, so please okay. hang on in there because I've got lots more to, uh, to ask uh, later on. And so now Thank we're going to move on to the next speaker. And it's uh, with great pleasure that I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. David Back, who's Emeritus Professor of Pharmacology and, and uh, in the Department of Molecular and Clinical Pharmacology at the University of Liverpool. Uh, and David's extremely well known and he's an international expert on the clinical pharmacology of HIV and hepatitis C and now COVID. And uh, he's got a very uh, special interest in the pharmacokinetics and drug-drug interactions. And you also might know that he's the uh, scientific lead for the Liverpool, we call it the Liverpool website. It's where you can go up and look at the drug interactions for HIV, for hepatitis, and now for COVID. And David's gonna talk about strategies for the management of these drug-drug interactions with long-acting therapies, David, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the symposium. So these are my disclosures. And the roadmap through the talk is going to be firstly to look at the multiple technologies with long acting, then secondly, the encouraging progress we've made. Thirdly, to seek to understand drug-drug interactions with long acting therapies, and then some key take home points. So firstly, the multiple technologies. We've already heard in this workshop some of the different technologies that are available, but just to summarize, we have long-acting injection, intramuscular and subcutaneous. We have developments with microneedle drug patches uh, and also subdermal implants, a vaginal ring, infusion methodologies whereby we have uh, infusion of long-acting and also uh, oral developments in nanomedicine to prolong the uh, delivery of oral uh, drugs. Let's define what we actually mean by these different uh, methodologies. If we're thinking about a law, an oral long acting, the dosing frequency is going to be one week or greater. For parenteral, intramuscular or subcutaneous, it's going to be one month or greater. Uh, and for an implant or a depot, something in the region of six months or greater. And these different methodologies give us increased choice in antiretroviral therapy, increased convenience, will simplify adherence, and will reduce the amount of the active pharmaceutical ingredient. It's really important that we understand the relationship between drug exposure and the target concentration that we're trying to achieve. If we look at the top left-hand corner, we have a drug which has got low potency and it's got high clearance. And then you note that the amount of drug in the bloodstream or the exposure of the drug in the bloodstream is for a relatively short period of time above the target concentration. If we look at the bottom right hand corner, however, for a drug with a high potency and low clearance, then the drug in the bloodstream is for much longer over the time scale that we are clearly interested in. And you can talk about the IQ of the drug, the inhibitory quotient, which clearly in this particular diagram is, is a high IQ for the window that we're thinking about. And our whole aim is to achieve the required plasma concentration over a long period of time. And that's dependent on the formulation, the absorption, the clearance, and the potency of the drug. And we're making encouraging progress. We have these multiple technologies. And the encouraging progress is primarily seen with the long-acting uh, intramuscular administration of cabotegavir and rolpivirine. And we've already heard in this workshop some of the exciting data from the FLARE trial, antiretroviral naive with the induction phase, uh, and the ATLAS trial, uh, which were antiretroviral experienced in patients who were suppressed. I'm not going to go into detail because these studies have been published and we have the publications in the New England Journal of Medicine. But simply to say that in both trials, it was once a month injection of the long-acting cabotegavir and rilpivirine. 
But we also have data from a, a study Atlas 2M, which compares arms with once a month injection and once every two months injection at higher doses of cabotegavir and ropivirine. And again, we have really encouraging data from these, uh, the, the, this particular trial. But there are questions that arise from the information, the data that we have already, uh, which really says we need to know a few other particular points around the pharmacology of the drugs. How do we impute drug interactions from a knowledge of the oral administration of cabotegravir and ropivirine? And specifically around TB, what are the drug levels if TB drugs are used concomitantly? And then there's an issue around the, the tail um, after an injection, the PK tail, and how will you cover this particular tail? And it's that aspect I just want to make a reference to. We've already covered it <coughs> in a previous session, but the data from HPTN 077, which is the administration of the long-acting injectable cabotegavir on its own for PrEP, showed very clearly the long tail that uh, arises after the injection or the final injection. Uh, and it's shown with the, the blue lines in male participants and out to a year or beyond, we have drug concentrations above the protein adjusted IC90 or even higher than that. Uh, and in the female participants, it's even longer. Uh, and visually you can see that in the red lines that the concentrations go out to one year or beyond two years, in some cases, above that protein-adjusted IC90. And so this raises a really important point, which was discussed in this publication, in the discussion. And one of the points that was made was that we have to think about drug-drug interactions in the tail phase. Now, what they say, or observation that detectable or quantifiable concentrations of CAB may persist for years, females being greater than males, after the final product injection. And this has implications for the risk of HIV infection, for drug-drug interactions, and resistance after dosing cessation. So how do we understand drug interactions both during the injection and post-injection during that tail phase? And this is an important issue for us to uh, unravel. Now, to date, long-acting cabotegavir and ropivirine has been approved in Canada. This was approved in March this year, during around the time of lockdown for coronavirus. And in the label, it says that no drug interaction studies have been performed with the cabotegavir injection. And the data for interactions has come from the administration of oral cabotegavir. And so we need to clearly understand the pharmacology of the cabotegavir and ropivirine in the injectable and understand the DDIs of the oral forms in order to be able to understand the um, drug interactions of the injectable. And also involved is pharmacological modeling. And this is physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling, PVPK modeling which is being used to try to understand the long-acting drug interactions. So let's just look at the two components. Cabotegavir is a drug which is metabolized by the enzyme UGT1A1 with a minor component of 1A9. But overall, it's got a very low DDI potential, as we'll see in a, in a few moments, as a victim or a perpetrator. And that's true for oral and intramuscular. Whereas ropivirine is metabolized primarily by CYP3A4, and I think for most of us, when we see CYP3A4, we think potentially drug interactions. And so ropivirine has a low to moderate drug interaction potential as a victim, and this applies again both to oral and intramuscular. And you can see on this slide also the half-lives of the drugs given orally and intramuscularly. Both the oral and uh, both oral ropivirine and oral cabotegavir are susceptible to drug interactions in the gastrointestinal tract. Remember that oral ropivirine has pH dependent absorption, so antacids can alter the absorption of ropivirine. And oral cabotegavir, like the integrase inhibitor class, um, undergoes chelation with divalent cations. So again, antacids uh, can be involved in the absorption. It's not 
Um, the, the total range of antacids, such as the uh, H2 receptor antagonist or proton pump inhibitors, these are the collation with uh, divalent cations. But when we think of the long acting, then we can rule out interactions in the gastrointestinal tract. So that's really important for us to recognize the difference between oral administration and intramuscular administration. To understand the implications for long acting, I'd like to take you to the Liverpool Drug Interaction Resource, the uh, website where there's um, all the antiretroviral drugs, including long acting cabropivirine, and there are over 700 co medications. And if we analyze the data for the oral cabotegavir, 96% of the data show up as green, that is, there are no interaction occurring, and only 4% show as the orange color, which means an interaction of clinical relevance, or the red color which means drugs should not be co-administered. Note that the oral ropivirine is much higher in terms of the orange and the red, and this then carries over to the long-acting cabotegavir ropivirine, which in a sense mirrors much more closely to the oral ropivirine than it does to cabotegavir. And we have information which, are, which then comes from the label, which shows to us those drugs which should not be co-administered. So in the Canadian label to date, we have a list of nine drugs, some anti-epileptic drugs, anti-tuberculosis drugs, St. John's wort and dexamethasone, where the implication of the magnitude of the enzyme induction is a lowering of both components, cabotegavir and ropivirine, or in the case of rifabutin and dexamethasone, just the induction of the ropivirine. But these are contraindicated because of the magnitude and let's look at an example where we do have some data. And this example is the effect of rifampicin on oral cabotegravir, where the decrease in exposure in the presence of rifampicin is around 60%. And with oral rilpivirine, where the decrease in exposure in the presence of rifampicin is 80%. That clearly leads to a contraindication, do not co-administer of rifampicin with CAB and uh, ropivirine. We have PBPK modeling to give us the effect of um, rifampicin on cabotegravir uh, long acting. And this is important for us to, to be able to see the effect on the uh, two components. And both of those components are decreased by approximately 80%. And so this really gives us, again, rationale for contraindication for rifampicin with the long acting. On the other hand, for rifabutin, the magnitude is less for cabotegavir oral. Rifabutin decreases by 20%. Ropivirine decreases by 46%. That leads to a contraindication on the basis of the ropivirine. Now, to date, we do not have the simulated PBPK modeling, but it will on the basis of what we understand, potentially lead to a contraindication, which we've already actually discussed. But how does this relate to our understanding of long-acting drug exposure? Now, these are the plasma concentrations from flare over 96 weeks. What I would like to highlight is that for cabotegavir, the exposure above the protein-adjusted IC90 gives us what we would call an IQ of around 15. For ropivirine, it is much less, it is around five. And this helps us to understand why it's the ropivirine component where the magnitude of the interaction may be greater and you're getting much closer then to the target concentration by lowering the exposure of the drug. In the Liverpool database, we've also indicated some other drugs which are contraindicated and these are some other potent enzyme inducers and also some more moderate enzyme inducers. And here's a list of 12. And it's either both components which are affected or just the ropivirine component which is affected. And so this awareness of enzyme induction is clearly one of the important issues that we have to think of in terms of long-acting drug exposure. What other interactions should we look out for? Well, CAB and ropivirine are not expected to alter the PK of other drugs, and that's important for us to recognize. However, 
There is a cautionary statement for use in combination with drugs which have got a known risk of torsad decline. And so we need to recognize that there are drugs, and here's a list of some drugs, uh, 13 or so drugs, which all have a known risk of an effect on the, uh, on the heart and a risk of torsad decline. Uh, and there's a very good website, crediblemeds.org, which, which highlights all of the drugs uh, in relation to this particular side effect. Uh, and because rolpivirine has an exposure-related effect on QT, then we have to think about this as a cautionary um, statement around cabotegavir rolpivirine with drugs which have got a known risk of TDP. Now in the Liverpool database to date, because um, we just have approval in Canada, we've had relatively few searches, uh, around 3,000 searches, and the top drug searches have been probably not unexpectedly, enzyme inducers such as carbamazepine and rifampicin and St. John's wort, and there are other drugs which clearly have no effect on this particular interaction. And so some final key take-home points. Number one is that we still have to think about drug interactions with long-acting as we do with oral, because patients have multimorbidities and polypharmacy and potentially polydoctory. But I would point out that we're not so concerned about long-acting being a perpetrator of interactions. We have to think about the long-acting being a victim of an interaction. And reduced exposure of both rolpivirine and in some cases cabotegavir, rolpivirine being greater than cabotegavir, and also some potential effects on TDP. And remember, it's not only during the injection period, but also post-injection that we have to think about drug interactions. So our strategy for management, which is the point of this talk, is awareness and avoidance. Be aware, seek to avoid. And our awareness also comes from other therapeutic areas. So for example, uh, in contraception, we have very good uh, information about long-acting contraceptives. And this is data with the implant, the uh, levonorgestrel-based implant, where an interaction with antiretroviral therapy, a Favarin's-based, causes a 50% decrease in the exposure. So we know that some long-acting, you do have a critically important drug interaction occurring. And it's actually very difficult to overcome because even doubling the dose of this implant didn't overcome the interaction with a favarin. So let's take an awareness from other therapeutic areas as well. And the final take home point is as we look forward beyond the long acting, uh, exciting data that we have with cabotegavir or pivarine, we look to Islatravir, for example, this nucleoside reverse transcription translocation inhibitor. We're not expecting very many interactions. This is a nucleoside. We can think of GS6207, the capsid inhibitor, where we are awaiting data, but uh, our understanding is that use with strong CYP3A inhibitors, for example, or PGP inhibitors will be permitted, although we're awaiting data for inducers. And therefore, my grateful thanks to a, an excellent team in Liverpool who provide a lot of the resources for drug interactions in HIV, hepatitis, cancer, and also, in the last three months, a COVID drug interaction website, which was developed in, in record time. So my thanks to the team in Liverpool. David, thank you very much. And as usual, uh, extremely uh, clear and informative. Just uh, towards the end, you talk about contraception. Um, is there any interaction that you know with the real pivirine and cabotegavir injection and, and contraception? Uh, whether it's oral or implants? So none of the oral contraceptives um, have an enzyme inducing effect. And I think that's where we're really more concerned is where you will lower the exposure, particularly of real pivirine. So I think in terms of the contraception, um, there is no known or likely interaction based on the data that we have to date because with the contraceptives, we're mostly thinking about an effect on the contraceptive, um, such as we show with the favarins, for example. So cabotegavir and rolpivirine are unlikely to have that, ef that effect. So, uh, I mean, at this moment, I, I, I can't see an interaction between the, 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 uh, the two therapeutic areas. Okay, well, that's very reassuring. The other thing is, what about genetic polymorphisms? Now, we saw it with the Feverans, and we wonder where it goes on with other drugs. 
Are there any genetic polymorphisms that might accelerate or reduce the metabolism of either of these drugs that, that have been looked at? I think you're always interested to know whether there's a subpopulation of people who might um, have a genetic polymorphism, will which will help to explain some of the variability. Just looking at the tail, for example, in HBTN077, um, HBTN the variability in the tail is quite marked. And although you have a mean half-life in, in men of 45 uh, days and a mean half-life in women of 60 days, the variability is great. Now, is some of that variability caused by genetics? Have we worked out all that variability? Um, with UGT1A1, there are polymorphisms in UGT1A1. And probably some folk will remember that there was um, an interest that dolutegavir exposure, um, high dolutegavir exposure might be related to a polymorphism and some of the potential CNS effects might be related to a polymorphism. Um, I, you know, I think that the jury's out on that, but I wouldn't rule out that there are polymorphisms that could explain some of you know, the variability that we see in the exposure um, of, of both CAB, uh, uh, particularly CAB with UGT1A1, less so with rupivirine because it's mainly CYP3A4. Yeah, and one of the reasons I ask is, I mean, when this goes to two monthly, there may be some people who you don't want to give two monthly if they've got something like this. And there may be some people because of, uh, that you might be able to give it every three months or four months because uh, they're there. Is, do you know any data? I mean, you've explained about the polymorphisms, but is there any data giving these drugs uh, a little bit longer to, to people, uh, higher, longer periods of time? You know, one of the passions I've had is inter-individual, understanding inter-individual variability and trying to um, uh, dose um, individuals in terms of uh, what the characteristics of the patient is, which would justify maybe a different dosing regimen. And I think, you know, I, I think we're on the way to understanding more of that, but we've got a long way to go. But theoretically, you know, I'm not saying at the moment we can do it, but theoretically, you're absolutely right. You could, you could think of individuals who would benefit from a one monthly injection and others who could benefit from a three monthly injection. Now, in terms of, you know, putting that into practice, whether you can do that, you know, maybe that's up for discussion. And I'm sure Monica and Pedro would have views on that as well later. But, you know, I think it's an interesting concept, Anton. Yeah, it might be the use of the hair concentrations because uh? if you do if you give it two monthly for a while you could then check and if it's really all very high all the way along you could yeah. maybe extend out but who knows okay well we, we might come back to that and I, I will ask monica and pedro what their thoughts are but thanks david so please hang on for the roundtable discussion uh, and now we're going to move on to our next speaker uh, um who's professor pedro khan uh from fundacion Josued in buenos aires argentina and now Pedro has been in HIV for at least 45 years, and he's the president of this foundation, which is the largest NGO in Argentina. Uh, he's published so much on uh, antiretrovirals. And he, uh, if you remember, he was the, the real vanguard of, of looking at dual therapy, modern dual therapy. Uh, and it's with great pleasure that uh, I'm going to introduce his talk, which is Introducing new therapies in middle income countries. Thanks, Pedro. Hi, my name is Pedro Can. I am very pleased to be part of the Global HIV Clinical Forum organized by Virology Education. My task today is to discuss with you novel treatment strategies for low and middle income countries. These are my disclosures. If we look a little bit uh, uh, at the current guidance, we will see that they are overwhelmingly uh, occupied by uh, integrase inhibitors. You can see that the Tegravir, Dolotegravir, and Raltegravir are part of the DHHS guidelines. The, the, the same holds true for ISUSA, with the exception of Raltegravir. The European guidelines contain uh, all four integrase inhibitors, but also Ripivirin, Doravirin, and Darunavir, Ritonavir. And yeah, the WHO guidance, Dolotegravir is the only uh, preferred first-line drug. So uh, what we see here is that uh, different guidelines uh, are in some way uh, have a point of coincidence in the, in the use of uh, integrase inhibitor, particularly those that are called the second generation integrase inhibitors like Itegravir and Dolotegravir. Probably ISUSA uh, will be updated uh, after the International AIDS Conference happening these days. 
If we look in particular to the WHO recommendation for first-line regimens, you can see that tenofovir 3 tc or eventually FTC plus dolutegravir is the preferred first-line regimen for adults and adolescents, while abacavir 3 tc and dolutegravir is so for, for children and for newborns is act 3 tc and raltegravir. And there are some alternative first-line regimens like efavirids in a lower dose of 400 milligrams, which I will show you in a, in a minute, and several other combinations for special circumstances. You can read this at the WHO webpage. The story of efavirids is a very interesting one because efavirids was the standard of care for low, in, low, middle, and high-income countries for several years. But this stopped when Raltegravi showed superiority at five years. Initially, uh, it was done inferior at 48 weeks, but uh, as time went by, uh, superiority was shown. Dolotegravir showed superiority at 48 weeks. Even Rinpivirin showed superiority at 48 weeks, provided that the patients were in the strata of le less than 100,000 copies. And on top of that, an ACTC meta-analysis of four studies showed a two-fold increase of, in the risk of suicidality with first-line efavirids. On the other part of the slide, you can see that resistance is a concerning issue regarding efavirids. In different regions of the world, as you can see, they are reaching or, or they are eventually surpass the 10% threshold of resistance that could be admissible, uh, admissible in, uh, in, in special circumstances for a drug to be used in the first line. So as you can see, efavirids is, is no longer the first uh, drug of choice, even in, in low and middle income countries. Regarding the dose reduction that I talked about, uh, David Cooper's group uh, and several co-workers studied the, uh, the reduced dose of 400 milligrams of efavirenz and compared it to the standard of care dose of 600 milligrams. And they showed that really there is no non-inferiority between these, these two options. But if you go to the bottom part of the slide, you will see that there's no difference in the statistically significant difference in terms of adverse events or adverse events related to the study drug. So uh, there is no advantage in terms of uh, tolerability. It, it, for, for sure, it's cheaper because you are using less active pharmaceutical ingredient. But there are several, several question marks, uh, including the resistant one that, 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 that I was talking about a minute ago. And also, there is no data regarding pregnancy or anti-tuberculosis anti therapies. But we have good news in the non-nucleoside field. The, here you can see doravirin. Doravirin is a second generation non-nucleoside that has been compared to efavirenz and to, uh, to darunavir-ritonavir. Darunavir-ritonavir in the left side of the slide, in the drive forward, uh, plus two nu nucleoside was compared to, to doravirin plus two nucleoside. And as you can see, no non-inferiority was shown. And the same happens to be too in the drive ahead study, in which the Doravid 3TC TDF in a fixed dose combination was compared to a Fabian FTC TDF, also a fixed dose combination. And again, non inferiority was shown. The, the drug has a very good lipid profile and a significant lower rate of neuro, neuropsychiatric events when compared to a Fabian FTC and, and Tenofovir. But also, the resistant pattern is a very interesting one. What you see here are four panels, Doravirin, Efavirin, Rimpivirin, and Etravirin. And you, you can see that several mutations are affecting the other drugs. And only the Y188L is a major mutation for, for Doravirin. And you need a combination of different mutations in order to uh, reduce the activity of, of Doravirin, which doesn't happen with the other drugs. So really, Doravirin is a different compound in the field of the non-nucleoside uh, drugs. Coming to darunavir ritonavir which is still the surviving PI in, in, in first line in some guidelines, it, we, we now have a single tablet regimen. So the, for, for the first time, we can provide a, a PI therapy with a, with a single tablet regimen using the darunavir covisistat FTC and TAF. And this was compared to darunavir covisistat co-formulated plus a second pill of tenofovir FTC. And again, non-inferiority was shown at week 48 and, and at week 96 with almost no resistance in the few patients that, that uh, uh, really failed, uh, resistance was, was looked after and only uh, one patient with M184B in each arm was, was identified, with no ev evidence of emergent darunavir uh, or tenofovir resistant associated mutations. Regarding integrase inhibitors, we, we have a very nice outline of, of studies. Raltegravir was shown to be non-inferior to efavirenz and superior at, at five years, as I told you equivalent to atazanavir and darunavir at 96 weeks, 
And now we have a QD uh, dosing available, two pills of 600 milligrams, uh, in which you need uh, eventually a third pill of tenofovir and uh, 3TC or FTC. Elvitegravir was shown to be non inferior to efavirenz or to atazanavir at 48 weeks and superior to atazanavir and etonavir in women. Tolutegravir has several studies. Uh, it has been shown in the spring too to be non inferior to raltegravir, superior to tenofovir uh, FTC efavirenz at 48 and 96 weeks, superior to daronavir in the same time frame uh, in the Flamingo study, superior to atazanavir and etonavir in women in the ARIA study, and finally, Last but not least, in the Gemini study, Dolotegravir 3TC was shown to be non inferior to triple therapy based on, on Dolotegravir. Uh, Bictegravir has shown to be non inferior to Dolotegravir in the 1489 and 1490 studies. And here you have the study that I just mentioned. The 1489 is a comparison between fixed dose combination of Bictegravir FTC TAF versus Dolotegravir Abaca or 3TC. And you can see the numbers in the, in the in the right part, in which you see that uh, using the analysis of BC equal failure, around 88 to 90 percent of patients responded. And if you go to the second study, the 1490, which Pictegravir FTC TAF in fixed dose combination was compared with a combination of Dolutegravir plus another second pill of FTC TAF, the, the numbers were 86 to 88. But I want to, to drive your attention that in the per protocol analysis, the results are almost 100 percent for both arms. So this confirms the efficacy of dolotegravir and the similar activity of bictegravir in these two studies. Dolotegravir 3 dc as you know, is, uh, has been presented, uh, we, we presented the results of 48 weeks and 96 weeks. This is a dual therapy strategy that we started with a, with a Carrell study using lopinavir ritonavir, a complicated drug because it's four pills a day with several side effects. Then we decided to do this with the, 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 the same the same experiment with Dolotegravir 3TC. And as you can see here, non-inferiority was shown at the primary endpoint 48 weeks and also at the secondary endpoint at 96 weeks. So really we have a new option here to start therapy for uh, treatment naive patients uh, with only, with using only two drugs, avoiding the eventual toxicity that could arise from uh, tenofovir or, or eventually uh, TAF or, or avacavir. And the same strategy was, was explored for uh, using, uh, using it in patients that are already undetectable in a switch study. So patients with at least six months of viral load undetectable uh, using a, a TAF-based regimen were uh, randomized to continue with a TAF-based regimen or to switch to the Dotogravir plus 3TC. And as you can see here, the primary endpoint is the proportion of patients that fail to, to keep the viral load undetectable, and the numbers are very similar, 0.3 to 0.5%. And the secondary endpoint with this virological success, 93.2 versus 93. And uh, so non-inferiority was shown. And eventually, as you can see here, uh, the, the, this strategy is, is again a simple strategy with, with less chemicals in, in your body uh, for a treatment that is lifelong. So it's really an interesting result. Another strategy for simplifying treatment uh, using dual therapy was the SWORD 1 and SWORD 2 studies, in which again, Patients that were virological suppressed for at least six months were randomized either to continue with their, their regimen or to uh, switch to the lutegravir pivot. And again, at different time points, you, you see no, no statistical difference between arms, 84% versus 84%. So uh, non inferiority was shown. And interesting enough, patients with target not detected at baseline, that were 78% for the lutegravir pivot arm and 83% for the base uh, IRT arm conserve a similar rate of, of post-baseline target detected and target not, not, not detected across arms. So really it's uh, very important to, to see that this, this dual therapy strategy confirms that two drugs can do as, as good as three drugs as long as you, you select the appropriate compounds. Regarding resistance, we have two different scenarios. First line, first, uh, first uh, generation, that, that's what I mean, first generation, uh, integrase inhibitors like Lortegravir and, and Elvitegravir, they seldom fail, but when they, when they fail, you, you will have uh, the burden of uh, persistent mutations emerging, particularly the 148 and the 155, uh, and, uh, and this obviously uh, compromises the, the efficacy of Lortegravir and Elvitegravir. So far, no resistant-associated mutations emerge in uh, studies in, uh, in naive patients, 
either with the rutegravir or with ritegravir, which really shows that we have two different generations of integrase inhibitors. Uh, I would like to drive your attention to the to the findings that that we saw in the um, advanced trial, in which patients in, in South Africa, um, mainly patients of black race, and particularly women, showed an increase in weight when they when they were started in regimes containing dolutegravir when compared to efavirenz. The interesting comparison was that they used dolutegravir or efavirenz as alcohol drugs, but also patients were randomized to receive TAF-FTC or TENOFO-FTC. And the conclusion was that you have more chances to, to have a significant weight gain if you're a woman, uh, if you're using dolutegravir compared to efavirenz, and if you're using TAF compared, compared to, to tenofovir. In this slide, you will see here the, the kind of uh, synthesis made by Andrew Hill, in which he shows that treatment-naive patients uh, uh, gain weight, and we know, we know that this could be good because it's kind of return to health. Uh, everybody feels better when started the recovery therapy, so they, they eventually can gain weight. But if you're using dolutegravir or, or potentially bitegravir, which is a, a very similar mo molecule, you will gain weight much more when you compare it to PIs or to efavirenz. If you, if you lose uh, tenofovir in, in your regimen and you, you, you include TAF, you probably will be also gaining weight. And if you are a woman and, uh, and uh, from the black race, uh, you also have chances to, to gain weight. So this is a phenomenon that needs to be uh, further studied. And now we are entering in, in an era in which we are using different ways of providing antiretroviral therapy, namely injectable. And cabotegravir and ritivirin is a combination that has been studied in two seminal studies, the ATLAS study and the FER study. The ATLAS study was done in antiretroviral experienced patients, already undetectable. They could be in a PI-based, non-nucleoside-based, or integrase inhibitor uh, regimen with two nucleosides. They were randomized to continue with their baseline regimen or to switch to cabotegravir and ritivirin with a leading period of 28 days orally in order to avoid any kind of uh, unexpected uh, reaction. And then everybody was switched to receive monthly injections of cabotegravir and ritivirin. In the FLIR study, they, they took antiretroviral naive patients. Uh, they were, uh, everybody was, was started in a combination of oral dolutegravir, abacavir, and 3PC. And after, after the leading of 20 weeks, uh, patients were randomized either to continue this oral regimen or to, to start cabotegravir and ritivirin orally for, again, 20 days and then, and then uh, switch to uh, injectable cabotegravir and ritivirin. And, and I show you here the results the uh, pooled analysis, you can see that biological non-response or biological success, there is no difference between arms. And in the, in, the, uh, in the upper part of the slide, you can see the primary endpoint uh, shown, showing non-inferiority for the case of switch, and uh, in which you see that the confidence interval crosses zero. And the key secondary endpoint, less than 50 copies, you, you can see that again, the confidence interval crosses zero. So really, we can see that uh, there is no non-inferiority for this dual therapy, injectable monthly uh, combination of, of drugs when compared to standard of care oral therapy. Now, there is another study ongoing in which we, we, are, we are seeing preliminary results in which uh, patients are being injected every, every two months. And this really makes, makes it much more easy because patients could come to the clinic every two months just to receive a shot, and then uh, you, you don't need to, to care about adherence because the drugs will be, be releasing uh, slowly. There is another way of also providing long-term long therapy. You, you see in the bottom of the slide a small device, very similar that is used uh, as the implant for uh, contraceptive measures. And this could be filled with the drugs like uh, Islatravir, which is the drug that I am showing here, uh, formerly known as NK8591, which is a translation inhibitor. And uh, as you can see, it's a very active drug because it's active even at levels of 0.25 milligrams QD. So this provides the chances of using this drug in dual therapy combination. This is been studied now together with Doravirin and uh, probably will move forward also to be studied uh, as part of a, of a dual therapy implant or eventually for prophylaxis. So this opens, opens the, our, our panorama to new uh, different strategies. And maybe in the, in the next future, we, we, we could see patients coming every six months to the clinic just to 
change the, the, the uh, subdermal device, or eventually it could be a bioerodable -ero device that could uh, disappear and the patients need only to come to uh, replace the device. So in conclusion, the effectiveness of antiretroviral therapy is already very high. The guidelines are leaning towards integrase inhibitors, but other classes of new combinations that uh, enhances our, our uh, formularium. The patients are requesting simpler treatments, and we are in that way. There are different strategies in development. The first one is two drug regimens that is, is now part of the guidelines, both for 3TC dolutegravir in, in naive patients and for dolutegravir with pivotin in switch studies. And the other strategies that are listed uh, in, in italic are uh, ongoing, uh, are being studied uh, as we speak, but should be not used until the uh, regulatory authorities approve this, this type of strategies, until we have more data in order to make it work. So with that, I thank you very much for, for your attention, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting. Pedro, thank you so much for that review of all the data. Um, and now I'd just like to pin you down. The problem with dual therapies that we've seen is the hepatitis B issue. And I don't know if you'd just like to comment on the fact that, you know, uh, there's none of the dual therapies at the moment that will overcome this uh, problem. Uh, and that, that really that hand in hand, you need a hep B program or you need to be able to measure hep B. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yes, you are completely right because, as you know, neither dolutegravir nor repivirin are active against Hep B. 3TC is active, but this would uh, put your patients on a kind of monotherapy with 3TC, which is a bad idea because, uh, as you know, Hep B will, would recruit 20% of resistance uh, almost every year. So uh, the issue is that in countries like mine, for instance, in Argentina, we have a, a universal program of Hep B vaccination and the prevalence of Hep B is, is so low that this wouldn't be a problem. But I'm fully aware that in, in regions in Africa, this is completely different. So this strategy need, needs to be tailored to the reality of different countries. And you need to, to promote, for good, re, for good medical reasons, besides dual, dual therapy, to promote a, 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 a very ambitious heavy vaccination in order to get rid of this, of the disease. Meanwhile, you need to check if your patient is heavy positive, because in that case, you shouldn't use this dual therapy strategy. Okay, so um, I'm just also thinking about other issues that can happen in lower middle income countries. And one is the availability of resistance tests. Do you do in Argentina resistance tests in naive patients? And, and even if you do, what's the situation in Latin America in general? Well, it depends. In countries like Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina, and uh, Chile as well, you, you, you can get your resistance test before you start treatment. This is not the, the situation in, in other countries with, with probably with a different uh, socioeconomic situation. But anyway, let, let me tell you that we are trying to perform a study in people with the M184B in order to test if dolutegravir 3 tc would work in people with archive uh, uh, resistant mutation. The problem is that we cannot do the study because we, we, we cannot find people with M184B being naive. So, so far we have tested hundreds of patients and we, we got two patients with m 1 for v one refused to enter the, the, the trial and the, the other one didn't want to start antiretroviral therapy. So we are really, really locked in this situation. So we are looking forward to continue this study for six months more. And, and if not, we have to declare that, that the virus has defeated us again and ah. it's not showing the m 1 for v Yeah, well, that might not be a bad defeat, actually. No, no, no. Probably not. You might get victory out of that debate. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I'm, I'm more interested in the non-nuclear non side uh, transmitted resistance because a lot of countries have been using those, as you said. Uh, Feverens was, uh, Navarapi and then Feverens was widespreadly used. Uh, I, I think it's probably unlikely we're going to see transmitted integrase resistance even now. But, but it's, it's doing baseline resistance for uh, non-nuclear sides. You, do you think we need to do that? Well, you know, uh, most of the countries in the region have switched to, to the Lotteria the first line, either because they are buying the drug by themselves, either, by, either because they, they receive a special price uh, uh, purchasing this, this drug from, uh, from the Pan American Health Organization Revolving Fund, or because they get a special price from the producer. So, uh, so I think that the favorites is really fading out more and more from, from the guidelines. And... Uh, it will be a non-issue in in probably in, 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 in a couple of months to, regarding the, the, the use of a or not. And if you need 
if you need really to, to have a resistant test at baseline because efavirenz is no longer prescribed as first line in most countries. Okay. Okay, well, thanks, Pedro. And please stay around now for because we're going to have a roundtable discussion so we can get everyone's views on things. And now I'm going to hand over to uh, Jonathan Shapiro. Thank you very much, uh, Anton. Wonderful session. It's my pleasure to introduce our last speaker. Anton Pozniak is president of International AIDS Society and the upcoming AIDS 2020 International Chair. He's consultant physician and honorary senior lecturer, director of HIV services, Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, Imperial College, London. Anton has held key roles in the British HIV Association and in president of the European AIDS Trial Network Foundation, NEAT ID. Anthon has been a leading HIV and clinician and researcher in parallel for three decades, doing work both in the United Kingdom and around the world, both treating patients and doing research. But what's unique, I think, to Anton as a doctor, that he's never shied away from difficult decisions on policy and treatment access, even at the highest level, landing him, of course, now in his job as the president of the International AIDS Society. We're very grateful that Anton can take time in his busy schedule to join us today. And he's gonna to speak to us on starting long acting drugs in the COVID-19 era. And I'll hand it over to Anton, thank you. Hello, I'm Anton Posniak from London. And I'm gonna to talk today about starting long acting drugs in the COVID-19 era. Here are my disclosures. And what I want to do today is to divide this into three parts. The first is how we are prepared for global pandemics, because that has a major impact on about how we're going to deliver novel new HIV agents. I'm also then going to talk about the challenges for HIV care that has been specifically brought around by this uh, COVID epidemic. And then I'm gonna focus on the specific challenges for starting the long acting drugs in the COVID-19 era. So this pandemic has been a large scale outbreak uh, that's increased morbidity and mortality greatly. It's happened over a wide geographic area and it's caused significant economic, social and political disruption. All of these have major impact on how we deliver HIV care. Now, how prepared are we? Now, this is vitally important because if we're really well prepared, it'll have a minimal impact on our healthcare delivery for other diseases. So there is a thing called the preparedness index which looks at the public health infrastructure of countries, how good they are at their physical, uh, physically and their communication infrastructure, their fundamental bureaucratic and public management capacities, and their capacity to mobilize resources. Uh, they also have a marker of their risk communication. Now, when you look at the map of the global distribution of epidemic preparedness, you can see in the lighter colors, the countries best prepared for a global epidemic. But when you do look at this, you can see from, uh, from the UN United States and the UK, which are the two best prepared, the epidemics there were very severe. So not only need you to be prepared, but you have to make good political decisions to move forward in terms of uh, uh, treating a disease. So before I go on to the specific HIV aspects, I just wanted to say about the global impact on the healthcare workforce. So we don't want healthcare workers to die, and if they survive a pandemic, their ability to provide care may be reduced. Because if you look at the peak of a severe influenza ep epidemic, up to 40% of healthcare workers might be unable to report to duty because they're ill themselves, they need to care for ill family members, they need to care for children because of the school closures, and they're afraid to come to work. Now, there's been quite a lot of literature uh, evolving around HIV and COVID-19 specifically. So let's have a look about how you maintain HIV care during a COVID-19 pandemic. What about the impact of quarantine, social distancing and community containment measures on our ability to deliver health care? Well, our linkage to HIV care can be uh, uh, disrupted because if you're gonna start or continue antiretroviral therapy, Patients might not want to come to the hospital. They may not want to come to clinics. And those hospitals and clinics may be too busy treating patients with COVID-19. Patients are very fearful of catching SARS-CoV-2 in healthcare settings. And they're really worried about if they are 
diagnosed positive with COVID-19, they have to be quarantined away from people that might be supporting them and giving them care, or in some countries, even incarcerated. Public health authorities globally are focused on control of COVID-19. And of course, there may be diminished allocation of resources for other health care, including HIV. Hospital lockdowns cause the uh, disruption. It's difficult to visit relatives in, who are in hospital. It's difficult to visit hosp hospital if you're a patient. And even if you try to drive there or get on public transport, it can be very difficult uh, indeed to access healthcare in a centralized place like a hospital or a clinic. So lots of societies have now and organizations have now published uh, some guidance on how you might manage HIV during a COVID-19 pandemic. First of all, maintain care. And so what's happened is that we've moved all the patients to getting three or six monthly antiretrovirals. So their visits to the clinic are, are much less. Uh, and we've also uh, managed them by doing virtual clinic visits on the telephone or by video conferencing. We try to uh, make sure that antiretrovirals are maintained. We can deliver them to pharmacies uh, locally to where the patient lives, or we can deliver them at home. We've said don't come for blood tests unless it's absolutely essential. So if you've been undetectable for the whole last year, wait on your blood tests. We've used a lot of virtual and digital platforms for support. And we've only uh, had face-to-face -face clinics where you sometimes need to do that uh, in COVID clean clinics for the asymptomatic. So if you're well, you go to a COVID clean clinic, but if you're symptomatic, if you've got any problems, you need to go to a facility uh, where there's PPE to be able to be seen. So the DHHS uh, have suggested for outpatient care that you've got to look at the risks, of be risks and benefits of attending face-to-face, -face, that you should use phone or virtual clinics when appropriate, and the factors to consider when deciding what sort of clinic to, to hold face-to-face -face or virtual depends on the spread of COVID-19 and the patient needs. Uh, the British HIV Association have said that you should uh, do efficacy and safety monitoring at six monthly rather than any less than that. But they've also said don't change antiretrovirals unless absolutely necessary. Monitoring should only be undertaken if it's going to change your management in the short term. And the thing is that the labs have been overwhelmed by having to do a lot of COVID tests. So we've limited resistance testing in, in the UK to new diagnoses and confirmed viremia. And as I've said, we've been given prescriptions here, typically at six months, and we've not been recording patients early. If you're going to start someone on treatment, well, there, there is access to baseline resistant testing for them. But we have said that if you can't get that, then start a regimen with a high barrier to resistance. Um, and we have to consider by doing that, that they, then we don't need to see them so regularly, especially if that regimen has got low risk of toxicity. Uh, and that's really important. And our advice to them is got to be quite comprehensive uh, about side effects, drug interactions, and maybe to, uh, what they do with food and single tablet regimens. And obviously, this is very pertinent if you're going to start injections in a patient during this era. So if you are going to do that, which ones might we start? Well, there's ibilizumab um, and cabotegravir, rilpivirine, rilpivirine, which has been uh, uh, licensed in Canada. So this is the, the 301 study about ibilizumab, and this is in patients who've got multidrug resistant HIV. And you can imagine these are patients in which you should not stop the treatment uh, and they have very little access to any other effective treatment. So they have to continue with their infusions every two weeks. And that is challenging because they should be done in healthcare settings. Now, the other drugs to give are cabotegravir and rilpivirine. Uh, and uh, here's the FLARE study where, where patients were actually started with an induction uh, of um, dolutegravir of Acavir 3TC. And then when, when they were undetectable, switch to oral cabotegravir and rilpivirine to make sure they get side effects, and then switched on to long-acting drugs, cabotegravir and rilpivirine by injection every four weeks. So you can see that this, um, you could just start straight away here with the oral cab and rilpivirine, and then get them undetectable, and then move to that 
But <clears throat> this starting patients de novo on long acting drugs uh, uh, at the moment following the trial protocol is complex. However, switching patients is something different, and this is the ATLAS study. You could switch patients to oral cabotegravir and rolpivirine for one month and then start monthly injections. And this, this is uh, probably more where we would do this during a pandemic era if we were going to use long-acting therapies. But the good news is that actually you could get uh, people onto twice a month injections. The ATLAS 2M study showed uh, non-inferiority from one month to two months using this schedule. And this would be much more convenient for the patients and for the healthcare clinics where, where as I've said, staffing, resources, etc., may be relatively limited. Now, what about some practicalities? Where could you get these injections for long-acting drugs? Well, come to the clinic. That's what people would normally do, but there's been a lot of thought now about could they be given by healthcare workers in the patient's home? And obviously the healthcare worker would have to wear PPE, or could it be delivered by pharmacists in local pharmacies? Move to two monthly, as I've said, and again, we have to make the, look at the risk of using, uh, whether we have to use PPE or not. What about the staff? Well, we still have to prescribe, book patients in, we have to administer the injections. And the major thing is that patients may become absent because of this. They may not want to come to the clinic and we really have to chase these do not arrive patients. And what about the patients themselves? Well, there's been a lot of mental health issues during this lockdown uh, period of the COVID-19. People are very scared of coming to clinics. Uh, uh, they're fearful of catching uh, uh, COVID. They don't want to go out in the public for the same reason. And we have to make sure we can manage tolerability and side effects. Luckily for the injections and infusions that, that I've described of ibolizumab or cabotegravir or ropivirine, these are infrequent. So specifically, there's a few things we need to know. In the global side of things, there needs to be maintained a cold chain from where the drugs manufactured, the real pivoting part of the injection, if you're giving that, all the way through to the clinic, because real pivoting particle size and characteristics can alter a room temperature. I've went, gone through this IM injection schedule, where should it be done and who by, and how you manage injection site reactions. Many of them are mild and minor and could be managed uh, uh, virtually. What about if patients develop side effects? Well, some of those we can manage remotely. And unfortunately, some patients will have to come back to the clinic earlier than scheduled if they develop side effects, which are concerning to them and to, to, to the healthcare worker making the evaluation. And then we've got to go through this issue of switching therapy if they have to come off the long acting. Drug interactions, we really need to make sure we're on top of these during the COVID era. If some patients on long acting develop COVID, they may be given other treatments. We have to be very mindful of any interaction. Luckily, on the therapy given, the interactions aren't, uh, aren't great uh, uh, and they can be managed. What about this? And this is the most important thing, as I've said, that we really have to think about during this era, which is not to allow delayed or missed doses. Uh, and we need to be very mindful of this. And that one of the reasons is, is that adherence is challenging, of course, because of, of, of the need to come to clinics or deliver injections to someone's home by a healthcare worker or, or to a pharmacy. But the other reason is, if you look from data from the PrEP trials on cabotegravir, 17% of the drug was still detectable 52 weeks post-injection. And for rolpivirine, uh, a mean of 541 days, you could detect um, some drug. And that the issue for this is that if patients miss doses, they then end up potentially developing resistance to the drugs. So in summary, uh, there are big challenges. There are, there are challenges for the whole healthcare sector due into this pandemic. There are ones specific to HIV and, and then again, uh, in particular, for delivering long-acting drugs. And the long-acting drugs at the moment that we have are given by injection. However, the HIV community is resilient. We know how to do things, we know how to adapt, and we, ha we have in the main a great relationship with our patients, and so it's entirely doable, even though we have a pandemic going on. And I would like to thank you all now uh, for listening to this and look forward to questions.
Thank you very much, Anton. That was wonderful. I think I'll hand it back to you now for the round table and perhaps uh, you can have some discussion on some of those points. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I hope everybody's in the round table now. Um, we've had quite a lot of questions come in from the audience. And um, I just wanted to ask uh, about the cabotegravir of real piverine. And, and David, it's really to you about this issue of drug concentrations and BMI. Uh, about the differences. I mean, you did show some male-female data and BMI. What? What is? Is there a? Is there an issue there? Because there, there's sort of <laughs> to tailor two worlds. One world where there's a lot of people who are, uh, you know, quite, have got BMIs over thirty, and then um, then another part of the world where people have, you know, struggling to eat. No, <clears throat> I mean there's some interesting data, isn't there, showing cabotegravir with both. A difference in exposure very early on after the after the injection, sort of at four weeks, that you've got lower exposure with high BMI with cabotegravir. So you know there are some subtle differences with BMI, and I also think that um, very early on we did a study with you at Chelsea and Westminster on real piverine, um, and then another study done very similarly in in the US, and there were some subtle differences in PK with real piverine between people of different BMI as well, and body mass and muscle mass, et cetera. So I think we have to be aware of that. Now, whether this is going to be clinically significant or whether we're just talking about pharmacokinetic niceties or pharmacokinetic changes, how does that translate? For CAB, I think when you look at the IQ and you look at the exposure levels, you're so far above the protein adjusted. You know, with ropivirine, you're slightly closer. And that's why from a DDI perspective, you're seeing, you know, more DDIs with ropivirine. But I think, uh, you know, I think, it's, a, it's another factor we have to think about, you know, BMI, if you've got somebody who's, you know, double the BMI of another patient, then it, you know, it makes sense that there's going to be differences in PK, which could be translated into some clinical reality. Yeah, okay, so we, we basically have to hold this space until we have some more data about the BMI issue. I think so. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, maybe I'll start with Pedro and then, and then ask Monica what her thoughts you know, all this business that we've been hearing about that, you know, you're, you're on injections, but then you can switch to tablets if you are, you know, if, if there's a problem with accessing your injections and you can switch them back to injections. Do you think that this is too complex for patients to actually grasp and do this switching from one to another? Um, and I mentioned about travel, you know, you're on tablets, you want to go somewhere for uh, two months, you have an injection, you don't need, is all of that fantasy in a physician's head or, or do you think patients will, will really grasp uh, the, the need to think about pills? Well, Anton, you know, I, I don't think that there, there is such a category of all patients that 100% oh. <laughs> of patients will, will, will behave in the, in the same way. I think that one size does not fit all, certainly. Uh, I can imagine uh, we, which would be from my clinic the candidates for this type of therapy. In, in one edge, the, those patients that are completely adherent, I always tell the story that that particular patient that came to my clinic and when I ask him, how are you doing with your pills? Oh, doctor, don't be, don't be bad on me. Last Wednesday, instead of taking my pills at nine o'clock, I did it at 10 o'clock, but I promise it will never happen again. So this patient, you can be sure he will come back for, for the injections and if he's in, on travel, he will take the pills, etc. On the completely other edge is the patient that is, has a chaotic lifestyle he, he probably is, has some level of dementia or he's say, several uh, in, in a severe drug, uh, illicit drug consumption, etc., uh, or, or uh, alcohol or, or whatever. But he, he has a significant other that could be, could be the partner or could be a sister or brother or mother, etc., that brings, brings this patient to the clinic every, every month or every other month. And this could be also a good candidate to, to receive this type of therapy. And the third type of uh, candidate that I think about is patients that you probably don't see at your clinic, but they, we, we still are seeing patients that came, come to the clinic and uh, are occupying your bed be, be, because they, they have cryptomeningitis or toxo or so, and they, they are not able to, to swallow pills. And this would be probably a good idea to start those patients with injectable therapy that so far was not available for us, and now we have the chance to use it uh, as soon as it's, it's get approved in different countries, no? Okay, well, that's a very good point. But uh, Monica, so just two things. One to follow on from Pedro. Uh, are the studies of giving 
injectable straight away without uh, a lead in with Cabo, Rilpivirin, uh, oral. Do you know if there are studies going on doing that? Uh, the pro I don't actually know, and maybe the others on the panel know, unfortunately, with this. I mean, I think the lead-in should be like two days to make sure that there's no, you know, allergy, which we don't get allergies usually to antiretrovirals. And it doesn't seem necessary to me to have this whole 30 days of lead-in. And I actually think that providers will not always do it. But I'm not aware of studies that go directly to injectables from the old regimen. Do you, does anyone else know? Yeah, as far as I know, uh, there is an investigator initiated study sponsored by the company, but it's completely responsibility for the investigator that they are they are testing this this strategy of uh, studying right ahead with intravascular injections. It's a pilot study, and we will see the results. I think I think very soon. Yeah, but on the right. other hand, I would be interested if the other people think that they're going to always do those thirty days of lead-in, or do you? sort of trust PK as defined by Dr. Back and sort of say, I think, you know, it doesn't take that long. Um, no, it's part. an interesting point, yeah. point, isn't it? David, do you think, do you think patients could just start straight on? If, if, there was, if we found from what Pedro said, no, no major problem with starting in terms of toxicity tolerability. Yeah, I mean, I think it's been it's been the tolerability issue which has driven the thirty days, as far as you know. I, I think from the, from the company perspective, but you know, I'm really looking forward. I wasn't aware of the study that Sir Pedro mentioned, and I'm you know, I'm really interested in seeing how big is the study, Pedro. Sorry, how big? I, is I, I, no, I don't have the details. I, I have heard, I have heard that this is is being studied as we speak, right, but okay. I, I don't have the details. I, I, and can I ask you guys if? You're going to give me injectables, right? So are you also going to say, here is of oral pill in case there's a problem? Are we going to do that? Because it's, uh, uh, what do you think? Monica, do you think, do you think that's how we should start when we start I, giving these injections? I do, especially given these uh, uncertain times with the closing and opening and closing and opening of medical care. Um, I see, you know, expiration dates are a long time. I think having someone have at home oral cabotegravir or oral repivirine or even their Trimec or whatever they were taking before um, is the right approach just in case there are issues so that you don't need to be concerned if they don't have it. And that yeah. way, and they're instructed to take it if they can't get their injection. Pedro? Yeah, I, likewise. I think uh, nothing to add to Monica's comment. Okay, that's great. So the um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is about self-administration, because in you know uh, uh, what 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 these are intramuscular injections, so they usually give my healthcare provider. So I'd just like to ask whether or not uh, maybe we start with you, Pedro. It'd be possible for the patient's partner or relative to give them, or the patient themselves. Well, uh, I don't know. I, I, the the experience that we have with cabotegravir so far is the is uh, in the HPTN OEP3 trial in the prep trial, which only uses cabotegravir, not repivirin, and patients are being injected at the clinic. So uh, I think that some again some patients probably could do that. We have patients that are nurses, patients that are doctors th th themselves, and probably for for them it would be easier to to do so. And some patients are completely unable to do so. So I think it's a case by case, case by case decision. I wouldn't state this as a policy that all patients or, or no patients at all could receive the self injection. No? Monica, do you, are the, do well, you know, you know there any I, for this? It is a it is a kind of viscous um, injection. It is higher volume that we'd like at least in the studies to date. Let's see what it's marketed as and. Um, so it is, I think, harder to self-administer sub-Q, you know, insulin injections people give it at home all the time. But I am, I'm a little more uh, concerned about um, people getting it deep enough and getting it in. Um, and we've only studied it in the deltoids and it's harder to get, you know, that mid-deltoid region on your own. Um, I would say that California has, for example, um, allowed for PrEP to be given by pharmacists. Um, and we've talked about this in this session, but um, this was a California state law so that uh, TDF, FTC, TAF, FTC are given out by pharmacists now. And I do think that instead, the thing we're going to do here 
is have pharmacists do injectable, which they have to be trained on because they're not trained. And then, um, because shots are usually not as deep. And then uh, also we're gonna have a shot clinic in and out, like no one has to wait, no one's sitting in the waiting room. You just like go in, see the LVN, get your shot, go out. Okay. Well, that sounds great. Uh, David, um, uh, it's something that I've can, I, 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 when, when you were showing the rifampicin data, do you think you could overcome some of this by say, instead of monthly, we're going to bring you in two weekly? Because, you know, I mean, the, a lot of patients might say, I still don't want to take all these pills. Uh, and, you know, with, with TB treatment, if you go on dolitegravir, you've got to take the pills twice a day. And you're used, to, imagine you've been used to injections for months and years, and suddenly it's all going to change for you. What do you think? I think that's one of the things that this me methodology of PPK modeling can, can look at. It can look at all the different strategies to try to predict what the exposure would be based on once, you know, one weekly, two weekly, three weekly, four weekly, whatever. So I think you can get some information on that from PBPK modeling and that data I think will be available, you know, fairly soon. So it, it, it's, you don't, I mean, we're not going to do drug interaction studies. That's, that's clear um, with long acting. Um, so we're going to have to get data in, an, in another way and we have to make inferences either from the oral or do this modeling procedure. And I think the modeling will help us to understand that. But just to go back to a point um, just now about the injection, I, I would agree with, you know, Monica, in terms of the importance of making sure the injection is right. Looking at the variability in the tail, which we've looked at several times, the, the half-life of the drug is, is a reflection of its absorption rather than its removal from the bloodstream. So it's called something called flip-flop kinetics. So you're seeing the differences in absorption, in a sense, reflected in the tail as well. So, you know, is that something to take into consideration that if you've got a non-expert giving the injection, um, that could, you know, increase the variability. So it's just another something to throw into the mix. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Anton, it seems that we, we agree that most of the patients will not be eligible for self-injection. There might be a small proportion of them with medical training or nursing training yeah, yeah. that might be, but for, for, the, for the great majority, it wouldn't work. Yeah. And I also think there are challenges with relatives and friends and people you know giving injections. You know, it's, yeah. uh, it's there's always <laughs> a problem with that. We've seen that in uh, even in giving pills when it's supervised by others. Uh, what about children? Uh, it, first, it, David, I might just ask you about PK. Are there any PK data? And then Pedro and Monica about uh, uh, children and adolescents especially. So, so David, is, do you know if there's any PK data on children? I must say I haven't seen any, but I, I haven't seen any PK data on children. Uh, no, and in, given how long it took to get Dolotegravir approved <laughs> for children, I am concerned that we're behind yeah. on developing formulations for children. Behind the curve on that, yeah. Uh, uh, they don't like shots, but then again, if it's not that often, it's better than pulse, yeah. Yeah. So, Pedro, you do, do you think? Think that adolescents might group or uh, the trouble is that I wonder how many of them will have non-nuke resistance and uh, uh, who, who, who might be eligible for it. Well you know we have two types of adolescents no? The, those that acquire the infection being an adolescent sexually which are in, in general to be treated as any other patient because they are treatment naive but the others are the survivors of the perinatal transmission and these are very difficult to treat patients with very very low adherence rates. Frequently, they are orphans. They are, they have no, no no significant others to 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 really help them to to carry on with with treatment. And I really doubt that a, an injectable regimen would be so popular among them. Uh, on top of that, that repivirin will probably not be working because they, they were exposed to nevirapine in the majority and uh, and also to efavirenz later on. So I'm not so sure that uh, repivirin could be useful for, the, for, for, for this particular uh, perinatally acquired uh, HIV infection in, in adolescents. Yeah, and is that your experience too, Monica, do you think? Yes, I mean, I actually do think I completely agree and um, that an adolescent that acquires it sexually, we don't have that resistance concern. The issue with the resistance is we have to admit that it is two drug therapy. Um, mm -hmm. So we do need to be profoundly aware that uh, ropivirine does not have high genetic barrier to resistance because it is an NNRTI. 
and Cabotegravir, and I'm very curious to see the HBTN 083 results presented at AIDS 2020 next week. Cabotegravir does not seem to have the kind of more resistance barrier that Bictegravir and Dolotegravir has, at least in, um, we, you know, we have absolutely seen breakthroughs with uh, insti acquired resistance with Cabotegravir. So you do not want, it's not three drug therapy. You want, um, you want people that like be fully, fully active, you know, for Pivarine and Cabotegravir be fully active. Um, and I, the one thing that I'm concerned about, and I think we really need to look to the prep data, what are we going to see with resistance with cabotegravir? Where does it fall down in terms of raltegravir, dolotegravir, bictegravir, cabotegravir? Is it like more towards raltegravir? We really need to know its resistance patterns. Yeah. Well, we're certainly looking forward to that data. Uh, yes. I'd like to ra round it up all there. Thank you so much. Uh, and a big virtual applause to the speakers. <laughs> uh, we have to get at Zoom to be able to do that, uh, and, to, uh, and to Jonathan for hosting us here. Uh, and so uh, I hope you have a wonderful pre-conference and conference next week, and uh, look forward to talking to you all again. And now I think we're going on to the coffee break, um, and the program will then continue after a short interval um, for you all. So from us, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.